Hi, everybody. Welcome. It's great to see um, some people streaming in here today to be with us. Um, and I am really, really excited for today's webinar. This is a topic very close to my heart. And for all of the people who are joining today on the webinar, it's a we're talking today about great growth attenuation therapy, which is a means to um, uh, manage the growth and height um, of children who are very severely affected by disease um, in order to uh, maintain quality of life and keep them cared for at home. Um, and you'll be hearing today both from clinicians working on this side um, of this, as well as family caregivers who have um, gone through the process of making, uh, learning about growth attenuation therapy, um, or GAT, as you'll probably hear it called throughout, um, and uh, why they made that decision and, and what the process looks like. So um, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Gabby Conacher. I am co-founder of Deep Connections and will be your host today um, as the co-founder, but also as a mom who made the decision to seek out growth attenuation therapy for my child um, and took that to the ethics board of our children's hospital here in Washington, DC, um, and then went through several years of treatment. Um, but mostly you're going to be hearing from our guests um, who I am going to introduce you to now. I'm really thrilled with this panel. Um, first, we have Dustin and Grace Eads, um, who are parents to Paxton and Irene, who are 13 and seven, and um, both have pontocerebellar hypoplasia type 1b, um, which is a genetic mutation that impacts um, part of the cerebellar um, uh, portion of the brain and uh, number S, it impacts um, motor function. So Paxton and Irene both have a trach, are G tube fed and are on a ventilator. Um, and you'll hear more about them in a few minutes. Uh, Dustin is actually a high school intervention specialist um, and Grace is an elementary teacher in Ohio. Um, Paxton enjoys all things sports, especially rooting for the Cincinnati Reds, Atlanta Hawks and Philadelphia Eagles. Very diverse group of, of uh, fan base there. That's great. Um, and Irene loves unicorns and princesses, and they enjoy watching movies together and love it when they're able to go swimming. And you'll see some pictures of that, which is really precious. And I'm so excited about Dustin and Grace because they are highly committed to giving their children as many um, experiences as possible to help um, live, live as normal life as possible, given the challenges. And you'll hear a bit more about that from them. I'm also really thrilled that we have Sandy Lee Quinn with us. Um, she's a California native who lives in Iowa. Um, she's a really fierce advocate for helping severe and profoundly disabled children and adults to be cared for in the home environment um, and out of nursing homes and institutions. She's a single mom to a 15 year old son, but she also has two adult older children who are 30 and 25 and outside of the home. Um, today, she's joining us because she is Nana, legal guardian and sole provider to her six-year-old grandson, Ethan, who um, uh, uh, both her, uh, both, excuse me, both Ethan and her oldest daughter have SCN8ADEE. -E. Um, her daughter is higher functioning and in a group home, while her grandson, Ethan, will always be less than a year old developmentally in his mental state. And he loves wire beads, Daniel Tiger, and school. So Sandy Lee, is a, she has 25 years as a computer analyst um, and her own complex health issues, um, which includes two 12 inch metal rods since the age of 13 and then complex spinal revision surgery five years ago. And all of this played a part in her decision to seek out growth attenuation therapy for her grandson, Ethan. We also have with us, Dr. Phil Zeitler. He is the medical director at the Children's Hospital Colorado um, for, at the Clinical and Translational Research, Research Center. He's the section head for endocrinology and a professor of pediatrics um, uh, and endocrinology at the University of Colorado. He is also one of the uh, leading clinicians in the United States spearheading um, research into um, growth attenuation therapy and has helped all of us here um, undergo that process because he is the guy you call when you're curious about this process. Um, and we have Benjamin S. Wilfond, who is an investigator at the Truman Cat Center for Pediatric Bioethics and a pulmonologist at Seattle Children's Hospital. He is professor division of, uh, at the Division of Bioethics and Palliative Care and Pulmonary and Sleep Medicine Department of Pediatrics, University of Washington School of Medicine. He founded and is former division chief for the Bioethics and Palliative Care 
um, and former director of the Truman Katz Center for Pediatric Bioethics, which is one of the first such programs in the US. Um, so he's really a great guy to join us today because he has this lens of the bioethics, right? And we know that this is an issue that um, comes with some concerns for folks. Um, so he is the research ethics case co-editor at the American Journal of Bioethics and on the editorial boards of the Hastings Center Report, Ethics and Human Research and Journal of Genetic Counseling. He's the past president of the Association of Bioethics Program Directors and he convened a 20 person working group to discuss ethical and policy considerations of growth attenuation therapy that was published in 2012 called Navigating Growth Attenuation in Children with Profound Disabilities, Children's Interests, Families' Decision-Making and Community Concerns. And I will place a link to that in the chat um, so people can pull that up and take a look at it. Um, but as you can hear from these introductions, this is a really top-notch crew to help um, walk families through um, understanding growth attenuation therapy, why and how it becomes useful um, to families. Um, uh, Dr. Zeitler will walk us through um, how it works, what it is and how it works. Um, we'll hear from our family panels, um, some reaction to that. Then we'll hear from Dr. Wilfond um, about the ethical and practical considerations of growth attenuation therapy. And then we'll discuss and throughout, please be putting your questions or your comments in the chat. We will address those um, as and when we can. And we are really thrilled um, to get started today. So as I mentioned, you um, are free to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us a little bit about what brought you here today. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna welcome um, <clears throat> excuse me, Sandy Lee to join us and tell us a little bit about what brought her here today and what her experience has been. So I think the rest of us are going to go off camera so that we can highlight um, Sandy Lee and her beautiful Ethan here. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, Ethan is an amazing child and uh, has always been uh, moving. He has choreoathetoid cerebral palsy with his SCNA day. So his legs and arms flail extensively. Um, that picture on the right is my spine. And I've been dealing with that since I was 13. I did not have a choice. Um, Ethan needed love and care and to be able to survive. So he is, uh, I'm, I'm doing that for him, but I am alone. I do have a 15 year old son who's an incredible help, but I didn't know how to navigate this life. And it's been a day to day learning experience with the help of all of the doctors and healthcare providers uh, for him. That is my great Pyrenees. We can still hear you, so don't worry. <laughs> I did not even anticipate that, sorry. Um, the bigger Ethan gets, the harder it is to take care of him. And I've had wonderful people help me in making a bed so that I can stand. And we do have a Hoyer lift and we do have um, a stander. School is amazing and uh, the school programs here for uh, special needs children are one of the reasons why I am here and not home with my family in California. Um, with the choreoathetoid cerebral palsy, Ethan jerks out his arms and legs and he cannot stop. So we are monitoring that and diminishing that with medication, um, but not to the point where we diminish his personality because he is, he is quite an amazing young man. Um, but there was a weekend when I couldn't do it anymore. And I just sat down and tried to think, what could I do? And um, I came to the realization after looking at nursing homes or children's homes, which are, are not available, really. I'd have to move um, and who knows the care he would get. My house is a perfect environment for Ethan to thrive and live 
and grow. I just need help. And when Gabi talked to me during one of our meetings about growth attenuation therapy, I felt like the angels descended from heaven and uh, I had an option that will help me be able to keep him in the home. And uh, it's, it's scary thinking you're gonna have a um, 180 pound, five foot 10 grown man kicking and flailing, um, dangerous for any caregiver and uh, potentially not being able to get any caregivers or help with him because of the danger that he is um, or can be to himself and others. So, and I do have a friend that actually has a grown son who deals with this on a regular basis. And I just think that this would have been something that would have been incredible for her, but he's, he's 18 now and, and, and past that point. So this worked out perfect. I'm very, very thankful for all of you. Thank you so much, so much, Sandy Lee. I'm so glad that you're here and that you found this. Um, great. So I'm going to now welcome Dustin and Grace to join us. Hi, so I'm Grace. Um, these are our kids, Paxton and Irene. And like she had said earlier, they have pontus cerebellar hypoplasia type 1B. So they have low muscle tone and are unable to move their limbs and they require trach and ventilator support. So, um, my husband had a, initially researched this for, um, Paxton, um, because as you can see, we love to travel and do things. We love to, they love to swim and float in the pool. And we realized that if they got to be the same size that we are, we wouldn't be able to do those things with them anymore. Um, and we are definitely not homebodies. And we won, wanted to continue to be able to give them experiences as they get older as well. Um, and so when we met with our doctors um, at Cincinnati Children's, they agreed as well that they felt it would be best so that um, we don't outgrow the capabilities of the ventilator and we can keep there doing well on the settings that they're on for those kinds of things. So medically, it also was a good fit for them and they referred us to Dr. Zeitler. So we, can, we traveled to Colorado and see Dr. Zeitler in the summers out there. Um, so you can see us in the bottom right and the top left out in Colorado on some of our trips out to um, him as he watches their progress with this. So Paxton's been finished for a couple years and um, he's doing great and he's stopped growing, which is exactly what we wanted. And he's been pretty stable with his weight and height and Irene is finishing up um, here shortly as well. And then anything Dustin wants to add to it? Yeah, you know, I would just add that, um, you know, it, it was a very difficult decision for us um, to go through and look at it. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have, you know, a resource like this to, to learn about it, everything. I had researched was uh, was negative towards it, and um, you know they considered it unethical. Um, Dr. Zeitler was uh, tremendous for us in helping us answer questions and leading us through the path. Um, you know, and, and just giving us a resource to to really talk with um, and help us make this decision. And you know, we want to we want to keep them in the home, um, and you know, we felt that this was the best way to do that. Because if you know Paxton becomes six or six four, you know it would have been difficult to do that, and then the deformity that could come with that for his positioning would make it that much more difficult. So, um, you know, we just wanted to give the best quality of life we could, we can for them, and you know this was a a, a great way to do that. Fantastic! Thank you guys so much for introducing us to your your beautiful kiddos. Um, 
I'm going to now invite Dr. Zeitler on to talk a little bit about what growth attenuation is and how it works, uh, a bit about the process to de demystify that for us. So um, Dr. Zeitler, if you are able to come back on camera and um, pull up your screen. Uh, it says you have stopped me. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay, Can't there we go. That? There we go. Uh, yeah, um, it's that's weird. Um, there we go. There we go. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to try to do in the next just few minutes, and this will be a little quick, but I'm open to any questions at the end, um, is to to try to give a sense of. Um, what this is all about um, and, and what the outcomes look like. Um, Gabby, is that is that the correct image? Yeah, you look good. Perfect. All right. So um, I will start with, um, sorry, with this disclosure. Um, and that is that I disclose that my, it, my belief is that parents are the only ones who know what is best for their children um, and their families. Um, and I feel like that has been lost in, in a lot of the conversations about this therapy. So let me tell you about AD, um, seven year, eight month old male with several, uh, with severe developmental delay, seizure disorder and cortical blindness following a neonatal stroke. Um, family read about him, was interested in growth attenuation, but were unable to identify a willing provider at their regional children's hospital. He requires full care. He's diapered. He drinks from a sippy cup if it's held for him, and he eats pureed food. He's unable to help with transfers, though he'll, he'll lift his leg up uh, to be in a lap. He's unable to communicate, but will reach for sippy cup or mom's hands. No response to questions. No sign language. Um, he goes to a program and has a 40 hour a week nurse and home health assistant 35 hours a week. Family has a Hoyer lift and a wheelchair van. He lives with his mom, dad, two daughters, who are 10 and five. He likes to cuddle, bathe and eat. Family was concerned um, as were the Eads that he will be restricted from participating in re regular activities if he grows to his expected height. He enjoys hiking and mom can still carry him on her back, but she doesn't know for how much longer. Two nannies have had fractures from lifting him and he has had multiple falls when he has been lifted and carried. He, was fall he has fallen on mom when she is carrying him and he's fallen on her in the bathtub. The Hoyer lift doesn't go into the bathtub and you can't take a Hoyer lift with you when you leave the house. When he was younger, they were unsure where he would be functionally and would not have intervened, but they are now more aware of what he will probably do and not do. Pulmonary specialists are supportive of attenuation due to his marginal respiratory status as he is getting bigger. The family goal was to make it possible for him to stay with his family. He recognizes family faces and voices and he is calmer when he's at home. The family does not feel that he would do well in another residential setting or an institution, even if such institutions existed. It's interesting that when mom was growing up, she had a great uncle that her grandmother cared for until she got too old. Then he was put into a family home, but the host family was into uh, illegal drugs and the great uncle was poorly cared for. The family finally had to get him out. AD's parents do not feel that stature has any meaning to him, and they believe that he would choose to stay with the family over any other choice if he could make this decision. Options are never good when uh, you have to pick the best one for the family. We reviewed the potential risks and unknown benefits. Uh, the Children's Hospital Colorado Ethics Committee had previously determined that there are no fundamental ethical issues in promoting shorter stature in individuals in whom height is not beneficial. They also thought that medical interventions to facilitate care like G-tubes and trachs are common in medically complex children. Parents generally know what is best for their child and family and the wishes of the family should be followed if they are acting according to their perception 
of the best interest of the child. Baseline laboratory evaluation was done to exclude contraindications, which we'll talk about, and then the family elected to proceed. So in order to talk about growth attenuation, um, we first need to talk about how to look at a growth chart. Um, and this is a growth chart of a young man. Um, you should be able to see my, um, my arrow. Um, and I, I just picking this to point out uh, some features of the growth chart. Um, you're all probably aware of this. Um, this is um, a, a, a chart showing the heights uh, of the child uh, population at various ages. Um, and this is divided by percentiles. So at the bottom is the fifth percentile. That means that five out of 100 kids would be shorter than that height. Um, 50th percentile means that 50% are shorter and 50% are taller. And the 97th percentile means that 3% are taller and 97% shorter. Um, What we see here is when this young man came to see us, he'd already experienced uh, uh, his growth spurt with crossing uh, of these percentiles. I'll come back to some of these additional uh, markings on here in just a moment. We also need to talk about bone age. Um, and what bone age is, is a means to determine degree of development. So for example, puberty in a boy will generally start at a bone age of 12, even if they are 10 or 15. So in a sense, a bone age tells you what the biological age of the child is. It's a better predictor of development than chronological age. In addition, bone age indicates the remaining growth potential uh, for that child. And I'll show you the impact of that in just a moment. So here we have a bone age of a young child. Um, you see what looks like two bones here, but in fact, this is a single bone. This is the the Dr. Zaitler, part of the bone. I can't see your pointer for some reason. Oh, uh, hmm, is there a pointer here? What is this? A laser pointer, here we go. That's is that it. better? Yep, perfect. Okay, great. So look, this looks like two bones here, but in fact, this is um, a, a single bone. Uh, the part there that's dark just hasn't uh, calcified yet. And it's the uncalcified part of the bone that grows. As that bone matures, the whole thing will eventually calcify um, and look like uh, this so that those bones are now connected. Um, and that's when growth stops. So uh, uh, looking at um, the degree of maturation of each of these bones tells us how much growth um, is remaining. Again, I'll show you what that means in a moment. The other thing we need to think about is genetic potential. And this is statistically uh, determined um, by taking into account the mother and father's height, um, subtracting uh, five inches for girls, and adding five inches for boys, and then dividing by two. And that's basically just correcting for the difference in heights of the average uh, men and women. So what does all this mean? What we can do is we can chart the genetic potential based on the parents' heights. And in our charts, that's shown right here. So we see that this young man's genetic potential would be quite tall, somewhere around six foot three. The other thing we can do is we can, because bone age reflects growth potential, we can see the impact of the bone age by kind of pretending that the child is the age of the bone age. So here you see a young man who's 12, but his bone age is 13. So we will mark him at 13, pretend that he's actually 13, and then we can follow that percentile up and see a predicted height of about six, uh, of about six feet. Um, and you can do this at, at all the different uh, ages. Um, and we will see the impact of that uh, on growth attenuation uh, in a moment. So that, that is basically the way we approach looking at a growth chart. So what's next? Determination of appropriateness of, for growth attenuation. Will it benefit the child and the family? Part of that is, will attenuation likely be significant? Is it too late, uh, essentially? Is optimal height for this child likely to be shorter than the projected height? 
Are there any contraindications? So we want to do baseline safety screening to rule out possibilities uh, of risk of clotting, as you know uh, from uh, information about birth control pills. Estrogen can promote clotting in susceptible people. So we want to be sure that there's no underlying problem with clotting um, when we start estrogen. We also look at liver function um, and prolactin, which is more of a pet interest of mine um, than a safety issues. We also discuss whether the family and other providers are in alignment or if we're going to have uh, problems as we proceed. And then if all is good, we initiate therapy. The therapy is based on dosing used in older protocols for decreasing stature in tall women in the days when they used to want to be shorter back in the 50s and 60s. Fortunately, we, re don't, we really don't see that anymore um, because of um, more wider, wider societal acceptance of, of tall stature in women. The treatment uh, we recommend is oral estradiol, two milligrams a day. We like this because it's easily um, uh, dissolved in water and can be done in a uh, G-tube. It can be done uh, with oral feeds. And we increase two milligrams a week until the dose of 10 milligrams a day. In girls, we initiate continuous progesterone to prevent overgrowth of the endometrium or the uterus lining and uh, possibility of vaginal bleeding. We then see these kids every three months for repeat laboratory testing, every six months to repeat their bone age, and we continue treatment until their bone age is about 15 in girls and 16 in boys. It's a little bit more nuanced than that, but that's about the, the target. And then we wean estradiol back down again to minimize menopausal symptoms, although I actually don't know if that's necessary. I've never tried to do it quickly. So um, this was our first case in March of 2016, um, uh, ended up in the New York Times. Um, many of you may be aware of this article, but it's an interesting read uh, about the family that first kind of pushed us into this. So what happened to AD? Um, so AD is here he is, um, started on estradiol. And what we see uh, at initially, he had somewhat of an advanced bone age, which is not uncommon in kids with CNS abnormalities, um, predicted to be maybe somewhere around 5253. Starts on estrogen, bone age advances very rapidly. High prediction is now substantially lower. Um, he eventually, by the time he is a little less than 10, has a bone age of uh, 15 with substantial decrease in his projected uh, outcome. Um, we recently completed um, an analysis of our completed patients to try to get some information out to the world about the outcomes here. Um, and what I'm going to show you is uh, 29 individuals that we presented uh, a year ago at an endocrine meeting. We just were uh, finishing up a manuscript on about 46 uh, individuals. Uh, the data aren't as nicely graphed and, um, and, and presented. So I'm gonna present the older data, but they're not appreciably different. Um, the results are almost exactly the same. So what do these completed individuals look like? Um, I apologize for this. I couldn't make this look any better, um, but um, about 45% were female. Um, is an overwhelming uh, prevalence of white families. Um, I, I'm sure you imagine this is an access um, issue uh, very likely. Um, um, primary caregiver was not almost 90% was the biological parents, but there were others. About half of them came from Colorado, about 40% from other places. 45% had a genetic diagnosis. 41% had some sort of perinatal injury um, and 20% had an acquired brain injury. 52% on room air, 34% on room air with um, other respiratory support. G-tube dependency in about 90% of these kids um, and 69% um, had uh, quadriplegia, um, but there was a spectrum. There were seizure disorders in about 60% of the kids scoliosis in about 70%, 
and about 80% were entirely immobile. Also 80% had no meaningful uh, communication. So here are the outcomes. Um, what we're showing here is the projected adult height. So this is the height that we estimated was the likely outcome um, at uh, full adult height uh, based on bone age and growth rate, et cetera, and then after. And we can see um, a decrease in the height projection, excuse me, uh, a decrease from the height projection to the actual uh, final adult height. Um, this shows the change um, greater in males than in females, interestingly enough. We don't know why that is. Uh, but what we're seeing is a decrease in predicted adult height of about 20 centimeters overall, about 25 centimeters um, in males, and about 14 centimeters uh, in females. In terms of side effects, um, we about 20% had progressive scoliosis. 20% had um, seizures, um, almost, I would say, always with an underlying seizure disorder. We have seen some mood changes. Um, we see abnormal coagulation uh, measurements. Uh, we've not had any clotting. Um, vaginal bleeding occurs in almost all the girls, um, and uh, breast development occurs in 100% uh, of the patients. Um, Finally, I just want to show you a survey that was done of pediatric endocrinologists um, uh, some years ago. Um, and what they found was that, um, that about um, 98 of these um, uh, endocrinologists uh, had been approached about GAT. Um, uh, 32 of them had prescribed it. Um, 65 had been uh, treated. Um, again, this is all self-report. Um, 130 withheld treatment for precocious puberty as opposed to actively promoting early puberty. 30% um, obtained an ethics consultation um, and 5% um, obtained an ethics consultation for withholding treatment of precocious uh, puberty. At that time, this was... Um, Ben may actually know when this was done. I forget now. This was about 10 years ago, maybe a little less. Um, growth attenuation is sometimes appropriate. 85% um, of endocrinologists uh, agreed, um, but 75% um, um, disagreed that it should be actively uh, offered, um, which is an interesting finding. Um, when you think about attitudes towards all of this. Um, so in summary, as endocrinologists, we recognize that height is not a good in itself, but can only be understood within the concept of functional height. What is useful for the individual? If the individual is, um, is typically developing and, and wants to drive a car, then being taller may be useful. If the uh, individual is in a wheelchair, that height may in fact be deleterious. There is no a priori reason why optimal functional height would be the same for ambulatory and non-ambulatory individuals. We have the same duty to support functional height attainment in non-ambulatory as ambulatory patients. Limited data on outcomes suggest that height loss with high dose estradiol is in the range of at least five inches and maybe as much as 12 inches, but there is a large range. Um, interestingly, this is quite similar to the outcomes uh, back in the days when tall girls were treated. Uh, the taller, the mid parental height or the genetic target um, and the initial projection, the greater the height loss and the earlier the treatment, the greater the height loss. And with that, I will quit by just pointing out that both of our animals, even though they are completely different in size, are dogs with equal abilities to have a high quality life. And with that, I'll thank you.
You're muted, Gabby. Thank you. Um, still can't figure out Zoom after all these years. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll invite the, the whole panel to come back and join us for a few minutes to, to debrief about um, what you shared, Dr. Zeitler, because I think there's a lot um, to chew on there. And let's see. So um, while we're waiting for everybody to come back, Dr. Zeitler, one of the questions is, you know, and you started, you mentioned this briefly, but we didn't really get into ages, but when is too late, right, to start? What is an ideal time to start? What's the cutoff? Well, um, you know, the, the more advanced the bone age, in other words, the more developed the child, um, the more of that height is already baked in. You, you can't take away height once it's baked in. Um, and so um, there's no time when you couldn't absolutely do it. That case that I showed you just to demonstrate the growth chart is one of the older kids we treated. The family really wanted to try. Um, and if you look at that, I don't think we changed anything. Um, he already, his bone age was too advanced. Everything was already baked in and we weren't gonna be able to, to change the outcome. Um, Grace is actually um, the youngest patient we treated. Um, and I, it helped that, um, excuse me, um, not, you mean I'm Irene? Sorry, not Grace. <laughs> yeah, you're looking at my name, Irene. Irene, yeah. yeah. Uh, Irene was actually one of the youngest patients uh, we treated. Um, and part of that was because Dustin and Grace had had experience um, with Paxton. And so they were comfortable. Um, it is my belief, actually, that the younger, the better. Um, because you have that much more that you can change. And I would agree with you because you we had talked with you about that. And we even kind of pushed it a little bit and to some extent kind of were like, we should have just gone ahead and started it earlier when we first started talking about Irene's case with Dr. Zeitler. So How old was uh, Irene? The earliest. Uh -huh. She started when she was um, just a little over five. Okay. Okay. Doctor, what do you recommend as the earliest that this could happen for maybe a brain damaged person or yeah, it's a really good question. I don't think we know. They have okay, to be I was just older. curious. Yeah, I think I think they have to be old enough that we understand their developmental trajectory. Uh, again, the, the key here is being able to figure out what is the optimal height? Is this is this a kid who's going to benefit from being taller because, you know, they're going to care for themselves and want to reach kitchen cabinets? Right, right, um, right. Or is this a kid who's not? And I think... It, it, there's a certain point before which you just don't necessarily know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ethan started at five, but late five. And part of me wonders if it would have been even, we'll see where we're at at the end, but if it might've been even more beneficial at four. So there's always yeah. that if the ifs always are. always right <laughs> yeah yeah but five i think i mean yeah five is about as early as we've heard of right so you didn't you didn't wait too long according to what we know so far <laughs> thank you yeah so we got a couple of questions coming in so um you know with the development of breast tissue um for a male um i'll address that from my side that is something that we experienced with our son during the estradiol treatments, he was, he did get some minor um, breast tissue growth, which did disappear. Um, it was not, it was not significant and um, not too noticeable, but, um, but it did deteriorate. Dustin, you're shaking your head. What did you guys notice with Paxton? Yeah, that was the same with us. We, you know, you know, I was nervous about that when Dr. Zutley was talking about that was going to happen, but it wasn't noticeable. Um, really for him, you could tell a little bit, but you know, when he had a shirt on, you couldn't tell a difference in it at all. And it went away, um, within six months for sure. After we stopped yeah. uh, using that. So that's good to hear. I'm not as concerned about it. I mean, the reality is this is benefiting everyone so much that, and I don't know how specific you want me to be Gabby. I mean, you know, with the precocious puberty and I'm going to have to get used to manscaping, you know, I change his poopy diapers. This is going to be my life. 
So um, same thing with the, the breast tissue. I'm not worried about it at all because what we are doing is thoroughly benefiting my grandson. I, and his I, I would want to point out that there's quite a spectrum and, and some of the boys do develop substantial breast development. Um, okay. I, I've only had one kid with a family they kept stopping and starting that they, they would every time the breast grew they would stop and then they'd say no so but most of the families just say look the child is atypical in so many ways just another one it, it doesn't matter yep yep it is kind of good to hear that it might go away later yeah it, you know, I don't have questions, but like the geneticist we saw last week was a little um, curious because he didn't quite understand why there was breast tissue. And then I explained this whole thing to him and he thought it was incredible and fantastic. So, and you'll totally, send totally him got this it. webinar after we're done. You'll send yep. him a recording. <laughs> yep. Yes. So we have another question that came in and I already made it clear that we're probably not gonna be able to do um, you know, recommendations about specific cases, but a generalized answer to this. So I'll read the question is that, you know, there's a, um, a five-year-old with Dravet syndrome or SCN1A developmentally delayed, but still learning mild ataxic gait, seizure control fluctuates, mother can no longer carry and is concerned about long-term care for her daughter. So as a case scenario, right, something along these lines at this level of development and growth, how would you advise a family um, in a situation like that, Dr. Seitler? And you're muted. Uh, as you said, we can't really talk about specifics, but um, we initially treated only kids who were immobile um, and requiring um, but care. But as we became more comfortable, um, with the limited side effects um, and the impact of the treatment um, um, so that the pros and cons became clearer for us uh, with experience. Um, we have begun to treat kids uh, who are ambulatory, um, but uh, again, for whom becoming taller, even though they're ambulatory, is not in their benefit. So they may have more trouble remaining ambulatory um, if they get taller. Um, so uh, again, we really try to come back to this question of, can we figure out whether being shorter is beneficial for this child? Um, and each case is a little bit, um, is a little bit different. Yeah, and it kind of leads into one of these other questions that came up is around, does GAT help prevent scoliosis in a child who is at risk for it? Doesn't have it yet, but is at risk or help, you know, minimize the impact if they already developed it potentially? Yeah, uh, that's a very complex question, to be honest. Um, we have seen at least one case where it worsened it um, because often these kids will have a growth spurt when you first start the estradiol. Um, and worsening of scoliosis is often associated with periods of rapid growth. Um, so uh, it, that did worsen it. Again, underlying scoliosis present. Um, in, in most of the cases, uh, it appears to be either neutral or to, or to beneficial. Uh, again, because if you can stop the um, spinal lengthening, um, you may be able to minimize uh, the worsening of the scoliosis. And I think one of the other questions that came is about, you know, kids who are wheelchair bound or non-mobile, do they typically still end up reaching their projected height? Um, yeah, this is obviously the, the big question is, you know, are we doing anything really? Or um, uh, would this have just happened um, anyway? Um, and that's gonna require finding a decent control group because we can't compare these kids treated and untreated. Um, that will take some work. I think if you look at the kids in whom we treated late, like that young man um, who was 14, um, he's pretty tall. Um, he's very affected, um, but he's pretty tall. So he certainly reached 
his genetic potential. Um, and I've got other patients that I cared for long before getting involved in GAT who are 6'3", 6'4", in wheelchairs. I mean, we all know these, we all know these kids. So uh, it, it's a very good question. It's my sense that we are shortening them, but I can't necessarily prove that they wouldn't be short otherwise. Yeah, there's still a lot to learn. I think, I think stressing that this is an emerging field, an emerging practice that we're still learning about um, is certainly important. Um, so um, I'm gonna do one more question now, and then I think we're gonna turn to you, Dr. Wolfond, and then we'll come back and we will get to all of the questions. But um, there was a question about um, whether growth attenuation therapy could potentially um, impact a gene, a potential, an opportunity to utilize a gene therapy or other curative treatment? I have no idea. Yeah. You, you probably know m more about that than I do. I don't know what exclusion criteria would, would be present. Yeah. I mean, from what I've seen um, there, I don't think it's likely that it would. I don't think it tends to interact um, in, in those ways, but that's a great question. And I think one that we should keep on the horizon um, and it looks like um, Dr. Zeitler, it's on Dr. Zeitler's radar now for the work that he's doing <laughs> to, to keep that in mind. Okay, so let's, um, let's shift back to hear from Dr. Wilfond um, a bit about the, the bioethics uh, and the practical considerations um, when considering growth attenuation therapy. So on to you. Thanks, Dr. Wilfon. All right, and I, I know you sent me, you had me send slides to you. I wasn't sure, did you want me to project my screen? You're welcome you... to. I wanted them in case there were issues, but if you oh, okay, prefer me, okay. I can do it too. I, let me go ahead. I wasn't sure. Let me just pull these up then. Okay, one second. Okay. I just need to like. Yeah. And while yeah. you're doing, while um, those slides are getting pulled up, I will place in the chat the article that I mentioned. Um, that uh, Dr. Wilfond worked on about 10 years ago now, we're coming up on the anniversary of that paper um, um, for people to open up and keep on hand for checking on later. Cause it really is a very interesting um, yeah. group that and, came together. Yeah. And that's what you're gonna tell us a bit more about now. Exactly, right? yeah. 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 Let me just, okay, here we go. Let me see if this, can you, do you see me or do you see my screen? We see you and we see the six slides. So you do. Oh, good, excellent. Okay. But now you see. Okay. So oh, again, you do I see your notes though. Um, oh, oh, get rid of those. I don't, those are like, I think get rid of those. I don't, those are old notes from 10 years ago. I think but, if you go up to the left where it says display settings, is that it? Um, upper left hand yeah. corner, is that right? I'm not sure if that will no, do it. it. The, the top there. Oh, this one here? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, there, oh, there you, go. you go. That's right. Hey, I just learned something new. <laughs> so, um, well, first of all, um, thank you, Gabby, for inviting me. And, you know, I just want to actually even begin by both in terms of today as how I got interested in this idea is simply that as a pediatric pulmonologist, I take care of many kids with profound disabilities, including kids who are on trakes and vents. And I have the, the utmost admiration for the parents who you know, dedicate their lives for caring for children who have all these special needs. And so I entered this space with just a, a deep appreciation and understanding about how the unique challenges that parents face and want to support parents as they take care of their kids. Um, and by circumstance, I moved to Seattle on 2006, and six months later is when the first news stories about growth attenuation uh, came about. And my colleague, Doug Dikema, uh, who was involved with those initial projects, um, you know, I started talking, and my, one of the other things I come out from in bioethics is the idea of trying to reach understandings and trying to help people who have different views learn from each other's perspectives. So I said to Doug, you know, well, maybe we can get people together because this is becoming so controversial to talk this through and see if we can come to some consensus. And at the time, um, Paul Miller, uh, who uh, also moved to Seattle from Washington, DC, um, become the head of the UW Disability Studies Program. 
Paul himself um, had achondroplasia. Um, and so I had short stature from a different cause. And I knew him from before we moved here. And I started talking with Paul. I said, Paul, can we, what do you think about trying to put together a group to work on this? And so we actually put together a group of 20 people who were, we intentionally chose because they had diverse perspectives on this, including parents who had children with profound disabilities who had diverse perspectives. And the goal was to get this group together over a period of time to get to know each other, to talk with each other, to see what sort of um, consensus we could or, or achieve between all of us. And this really went on from 2007, 2009, it was a two year process. The, the, these two slides are actually from a presentation we did um, at the UW at the end of this process. And I just picked out six slides that really are meant to give you a summary of what we talked about because I want to make sure there's time for uh, discussion. So we began with, um, and part of the idea was, was, was identifying shared assumptions that everybody in this group had that we all could agree upon, um, and which were that, you know, that many people, institutions, and society do not positively value people with disabilities. In fact, that really, I think, even speaks to the, the concern from within the disabilities community about this activity. It was perceived as being somehow that these children are not being valued. But we all agreed, we all were able, even this group say, look, we all agree with that. We, this is a critically important thing. And we need to figure out how to improve medical and social services for people with disabilities as an ethical priority. Because again, one of the concerns was, well, gee, you're going to do this rather than other things. And, and, our, and our conversation was, no, we all agree that these things are important. And we also agree that it's important to have welcoming attitudes toward people with disability. So again, these were the objections that were raised that we could all sort of say, growth attenuation is not intended to be speaking to these issues. And the other thing people agree to is that parents who care for children with disabilities overall should be respected and afforded some deference to making decisions based upon the unique needs of their child. And so we began with these kind of assumptions. Let me just speak briefly about what we covered in our uh, in our document. Um, I'll also share with you um, the document in front of you that you that that, that Gabby shared. It took quite a while to write, um, and the um, the first time we submitted this for publication, um, the response we got back from the editor was that you know this is an interesting topic, but your paper is way too long and way too boring. Can you cut it by fifty percent? And so actually what you're reading is 50% of what we wrote before. I think it's a much better paper now that it's 50% shorter. Um, but one of the things that we also did in that paper is that we had four short boxes of, of less than 800 words where two of the members of the group who did not agree with what we came out with explained why they did not agree. Actually four members, two who thought we were being too permissive about this and two who thought we were being too restrictive about this. And in the, each of those four boxes, one was a scholar and one was a parent. And so the idea was to use those four boxes as a way of acknowledging the disagreement, but also seeing where we came out to in the, begin, in the end. And so what we thought about topically were, again, as very much related to what Phil said, what are the potential benefits to the child, to the family? What are the possible harms to the child? And also the concerns with them among the community were about the disability community and society, were the harms from doing this. Um, we also talked about the importance of respect for parental decision-making and respect for the community of people with disabilities. And, and the, the challenge is how do we navigate all of these issues because we have, and, and try to satisfy them all simultaneously. Where we ended up as a group is that uh, while a few members had strong views on either end of the spectrum. Um, most found it generally acceptable, although they had a few caveats, and there were a few people who were still firmly against it. But it's important to, and I think this is important to, I think one of the comments that um, Phil made or one of the parents made about, you know, I think it's, while there will be individual people who think this is completely inappropriate, I think much, most people have a much more nuanced view of this. Um, and I think the other thing we talked about even in this process was that it was really important to have this conversation with people who had different 
views. I think part of the idea is, that, and, and this is even in the last 10 years has even gotten more this way, that we all tend to talk with people who we agree with, and we all tend to not talk with those who we don't agree with. But the, val the real value is possibly talking with those with whom we have disagreements to see if we can find some sort of uh, consensus. Now, what's interesting is that our group didn't agree with the word consensus because they said, we can't, we don't agree with everything that we're saying. And what people were able to acknowledge though is that they called it a compromise. Given we have different views, given we don't agree with each other, can we come up with a compromise or moral compromise to reach another ground? And so the way I would leave it is that most of the members of the working group had some degree of uncomfortability with growth attenuation for a variety of reasons and for a variety of degrees, but they also thought that it was really important to support the decisions made by parents uh, with appropriate oversight and that everybody was committed to the idea we need to try to figure out how to improve the welfare of children with disabilities, their families and all people. And you know, to, even in terms of my own opinion, you know, I can very much see how something like growth attenuation can be valuable for families. And I think that you know, the two families we heard from today are to me, actually three, we include Phil's family as well, you know, are, are great examples of where we can see in general how this can be useful. Um, I'm gonna have two more slides and then I'll stop. So our conclusions were that we, um, again, we need to work together to improve the lives and to support decision-making and, but also to acknowledge that these concerns exist. Um, and that we acknowledge that people have contrasting views um, and that we need to have some sort of a compromise. And the last slide is actually the things that back 10 years ago were part of our compromise. Um, we, we, our thought was, and part of this, the idea is saying, what can we agree upon now? And so the, what we had to do with limited eligibility, both to profound cognitive disabilities, as well as people who are non-ambulatory. And I think I wanna note here that, because I appreciate Phil's description, that they're, they're now starting to broaden this. And that makes total sense to me. In other words, that was a starting place. And I think as Phil was describing, we can then ask the same set of questions for ambulatory versus non-ambulatory. How will this be beneficial? Um, I think another thing that came up in our group a lot was a notion of a robust informed consent process. And by that, um, having a realistic understanding of the benefits, risks, and alternatives. I think, and even from hearing Phil's description of this, it sounds to me like Phil's doing exactly what we had envisioned, where there's a sense of the nuance, the lack, the, a certain amount of lack of certainty of things, but having an understanding of how this may work, how it may not, what may happen. Um, I think it's also important to understand the perspective of those who consider this. Ideally, those who've considered and, and have done it, like we've heard on the phone, and even for, I, I, ideally be those who haven't, although I, I think those who, who consider it decide not to do it, we're not as likely to sort of know about, and Phil probably is not likely to know about too, because by the time they get to you, you're probably, you probably already have made up their mind. Um, and I think it's also important for people as they're thinking about this to be aware of the disability perspective. I don't believe that that should, my own opinion, that that should change what a family tries to do, but they should, be, have, they should have appreciation for that perspective and understand where they're coming from and appreciate that they're coming from a very good place. They're just not seeing it from exactly the same perspective as parents are. Um, our last compromise was this notion of clinical, of, of oversight, of the clinical approach that's being used. It's this notion that we wanted to have, there be, there be some sort of reviews to make sure it's being done well. And I think, uh, and, and you can think of oversight as being external or even internal. I don't know, Phil, what sort of process you use for that, but clearly you put tons of thought into how you do this. And you know, it's typically in many research that I realize this is not necessarily being done as a research study, like often in research studies, there are what are called data, data and safety monitoring boards that are external people who are providing guidance to researchers and people who are doing things. Um, ensure that the child meets the criteria for growth attenuation, um, depending on what those criteria are, and then to sort of think carefully about the understanding expectations of parents. I think this gets back to the idea of the informed consent process would be not only disclosing what the benefits and risks are, but making sure that people are realistic about what they expect that will happen from this. So, so with this, I'll say one last thing as I end. I mean, I've been telling you about the process we used 10 years ago. The purpose of, with Gavin, I talked about this. I think part of why I thought this might make sense to share is for all of you on the call to both have an appreciation of 
in a more nuanced way what the range of issues are. Um, I think I would want to be clear that you know I support families making these decisions. I also uh, encourage families to think thoughtfully about this, to be aware of the various impacts, and to seek out a a, a provider who's capable of doing this. Um, I think that. As this expands to more and more centers, there will be an ongoing process of more institutions having to think it through the issues the same they were thought through over years at the University of Colorado. And I, I think this will gradually um, expand thoughtfully over time. Um, with that, let me pause. I'll stop. I, that's all the comments I had for right now. And um, turn it back to the panel. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolfon. <clears throat> <clears throat> I think that um, you, your, your panel brought to light some really thoughtful considerations that um, when I was considering uh, growth attenuation that I went back to to reference um, personally and think through. And I think <clears throat> we're getting some questions, um, but I want to, um, Dr. Zeitler, give you a chance to answer because I know Dr. Wilfon was asking what kind of oversight um, you guys use, and I think that might be helpful for families to understand. Uh, I actually think that um, Dr. Wilfond has, has, has raised a, a challenge for us. Um, um, I will be, well, in terms of the institutional oversight, our ethics in Guinea has said, you know, go forth and prosper. Uh, we're here if you need us. Um, and we have occasionally gone back to them um, to discuss specific cases. Um, and in all of those cases, they've agreed with our with our thinking so there there hasn't been uh ongoing ethical ethics committee oversight of each case um we uh, have sort of taken the um safety officer approach which is that there are three of us who uh, treat these children um we discuss them uh, regularly, we are aware of side effects that are occurring. Uh, so this this is being done uh, in internally. But I think you do raise an interesting uh, challenge about uh, as this starts to expand beyond our center, um, and there are one-off patients being treated in various places. Perhaps we do need to think about some more organized way to be sure that the outcomes. Um, are what they should be um, in the hands of people who have less experience. Uh, so I think that's actually a very uh, important challenge that you put on the table there. If I could just respond to that, or not respond, but acknowledge it. So I, I think you, you, you interpreted my comment appropriately. In other words, it's less about the ethical oversight per se, as much as clinical oversight. And, you know, I would, I I still think this can be a light touch. By that, I mean, if you, if you were to ask me six, you know, seven years ago when you started this, what I might have said, you know, what you might want to do is get a few endocrinologists from outside of Colorado that you just sort of, you know, kind of use like and you connect once a year and you say, here's where we're going, here's what we're doing, here's our protocol. You know, that to me is just a, which, and, and again, most people don't do that. So this is sort of, in my opinion, supererogatory, but it's actually just, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a cautious person. The reason why I had a 20 person committee is I don't trust myself. I want the other people to be giving me advice and helping me think through things. But you're raising a really interesting question about how, as this expands. And to me, if I were to see this expand, I would, first of all, it's important for it to expand because people don't need to travel to Colorado. But, and that's not a good thing. But I also think that you don't want to be having to done one off. And so the notion of having a few places around the country um, that really kind of you know, developed the experience with this is, is probably a better way to go mm -hmm. uh, because that allows for, and, and, that's, and that's what I almost might, I would hope would happen rather than it being just a one-off thing. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think in, 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 I hadn't really thought about it until just that moment, but in a, in a way it's almost kind of like the transgender um, experience. You know, it's clearly the outcomes are better when they're being done by <laughs> people who have experience and, um, and you know, centers have developed um, uh, around this so that there is, 
they're talking to each other and there is um, coordination of approach, et cetera. So yeah, I think it's a very good point. And I think this might be an interesting place to also insert the experience that Dustin and, Gr and Grace had because they do travel to Colorado, they shared to see you, Dr. Zeidler, because and maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about how that worked um, with your, because you're at Cincinnati, right, Children's. So. Yeah, so for us, um, we had gone to see endocrinology for a completely different reason um, with our son Paxton and my husband had said, when you're there, ask them about this. Well, I didn't even know this was a thing. And he told me to go ask the endocrinologist about it. And I was like, what, what am I asking about? And so the endocrinologist there was like, oh yeah, we, um, but they were there, um, there, the ethics committee at Cincinnati children's was okay with offering the idea of it, but they would not prescribe the medicine for it and did find there was a benefit. And so that's where we went. Uh, they referred us to Dr. Zeitler and we were in contact with him. Um, and I will say when we started with you, Colorado Children's did send us videos and things that we needed to watch to make sure we understood it um, and what we were doing. And you guys did, um, someone else had spoken with us too, right, Dustin? And um, we we discussed their treatment and then, you know, signed all the stuff that they could talk with Paxton's doctors and things like that at, at that point. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't just like a, let's just jump in and go. It was very much discussed with all of Paxton's specialists to make sure that we weren't missing something, something wasn't being, um, addressed or could affect something else um, in our case. And then when we knew Irene had the exact same thing, the doctors were fine with that because they have the same condition. Um, but I mean, for us, Dr. Zeitler has said, you know, people are doing it at Cincinnati Children's, um, are more open to it now, but we've just stayed with Dr. Zeitler. We like going out and seeing him <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> so advantage to that. Yeah. And it's that, and it's that experience in those um, years of, of doing this, you guys have totally made it possible for me to be able to hear what it is, found the New York times article. I was like, of course, this is exactly. And I have many, many, many people in my circle that, that have this issue with you know, 80 year old parents and 50 year old adult children. And I was able to go talk to Dr. Canner and it was all explained and perfect. And I, it was great. Nothing, I didn't, it, that was it. Mm -hmm. She taking care of everything. And I, hopefully that's more the future, right? That you I hope, yes, absolutely. Talk to a provider about these concerns and they say, well, we can get you set up and you don't have to, for, for us, um, we had to, you know, we went to go see an endocrinologist who was not familiar with it and not very keen on the idea and dismissed it. Um, and, you know, unfortunately there are some families that would be dissuaded at that stage and say, okay, I guess it's not something that we'll do, but, you know, um, for us, you know, I'm a, more pushy person. So I said, well, you don't get to decide, you know, flat out what happens for my family. So we took it to the ethics board who then approved it. And I think, you know, there was a question from Jessica that came up earlier, which is how do you even find somebody who does this? Um, and there's not really, I mean, I guess Dr. Zeitler, you have a list that you keep of people who've consulted with you or who have done this that you're aware of but there's not a lot of literature about this out there in terms of the clinical work around this, which is why your paper that's forthcoming is gonna be so important. Um, but how should people find out? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think actually Dr. Wilson just made it a little harder because he's right. I mean, you know, there's been, I, I, I'll be honest, I have focused so much on trying to expand access um, that I have supported folks doing this um, in different areas. So I do have, it's in my head, but I, I know who is willing um, and who has some experience. Um, but I, I think we, you know, I, I think we do need to be a little bit careful um, that somebody is not just doing it 
they're on their own and sort of figuring out how to do it by themselves. But um, I, the short answer is uh, through parent groups, um, that's how most of the patients get to me is word of mouth. Um, I'm happy to, um, if you have a local endocrinologist who is willing, I'm happy to speak with them about how to do it, um, how to approach it. If you have a local endocrinologist who's not willing, I'm still happy to talk to them about uh, options. Um, I do know a lot of people around the country and um, a lot of them will know me for various reasons. And so I'm happy to talk that way. There's not another another organized way to do it. Yeah. Oh yeah, Dr. Wolfon. Well, I'll pose a quick comment. So I don't wanna make it harder. I, like, like you, I just wanna make it better or make it as good as it can be. Um, but I also wanna appreciate, pre Kathy, I appreciate you talking about about the experience you had um, initially. And I think that's maybe the, the, the essence of what I want to also elaborate on that piece, which is that while the ethical issues are complicated, I think the point of me joining this panel today was to at least share that while it's complicated, it's not insurmountable and don't be dissuaded if you hear that message and that there's a more, it's more complex and that, um, we can get through this and, 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 and do this in a thoughtful way. So I think that's probably why I decided to join and spend two hours with you today is because yeah. I feel very strongly that um, I want parents to feel they have the support to navigate these types of issues. Right, and I'm gonna say one thing and then I'm gonna to come to you, Sandy Lee. And I think um, I should have added when I mentioned this is that it's exactly what we did is that, you know, we took it through the ethics board and then we said, okay, Dr. Zeitler is willing to talk to you and then, Dr. Zeitler was a consultant to our endocrinologist to manage the care, to read the, the bone scans, to advise on dosing, all of those kinds of things. And obviously that's not sustainable, Dr. Zeitler, to have you be the only one who is telling people how to do this. So, you know, I know that the publication that you have forthcoming will be a big thing and you're training other people, um, but hopefully we'll continue working together to figure out how to, to make this more available. And, and, you know, we're a resource to help with that. Um, Sandy Lee, what are you thinking? From a caregiver standpoint, when I talk to everybody who knows my life and what I do on a daily basis and how I try to manage things on a daily basis, they didn't, they didn't blink an eye. It was like, absolutely, this is totally needed. This is, you know, just many non-medical people who are just seeing how our lives are lived and how difficult things are and how this is helping it not be as difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. They didn't even bat an eye. They just were like, absolutely. And I think the more people hear about this, see the, the positive impacts for families, they'll, it, people will begin to warm to it more, um, you know? And I think one of the other things that came up is, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Wilfon talked about the disability perspective and keeping that in mind. And I think that's also really, really important. Um, as somebody who, before I had kids, worked in the disability rights um, arena, that's always front, of, front and center for me, you know, bodily integrity, um, you know, you know and, and these ideas about ensuring that somebody who, you know, functions in a non-typically developing way still has every opportunity and, you um, to live a full life. And, and frankly, you know, I think a lot of people who say this is inappropriate, you know, if it doesn't work for them, that's fine. But frankly, you know, the considerations for a lot of our families is that, and I would argue that Dustin and Grace and the way that they travel the country in their Greyhound style bus with their kids, um, they are a perfect example of how you can really work to maintain and keep a high quality of life for a family when you have access to this kind of tool, right? It's just one tool in a toolbox that helps us to keep our kids healthier at home, safer, um, and, uh, and cared for by the people who know how to care them best, uh, care for them best. Um, so it is the toolbox. Yeah, right. It's, well, this it's, is their body. This is, this is their this is them and, and being able to maybe get a smaller toolbox is helpful. I like that. 
<laughs> yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah, and recognizing that you know that uh, you know I, uh, you know I don't ever imagine that my son is going to procreate, right? I'm not I'm not taking away something from him that is on the horizon, right? So really recognizing, I was talking about growth attenuation with our hospitalist. Um, uh, provider yesterday who's um, part of our uh, hospice team who's and he's a big proponent of it um, as being an option for families right it's you know having realistic expectations for what the future holds for our children for our families and that absolutely deserves to be heard and seen and considered um, in these in these situations um and I think one of the other things my husband just reminded me is that when we were doing this, we were going through the process of getting this through our um, ethics board at our hospital. You know, one of the things that came up was, well, who is this benefiting? Is this benefiting the child or is this benefiting the parents, right? And, um, and there was some discussion about whether, okay, don't talk about how it benefits the parents as much because this is child's care. This is about the child and the, you know, their development. Um, but I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. I saw, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Wolfon. And then I saw I'll Dustin, respond. you shaking your head too, yeah. yeah. I'll respond to me. I think that's a false distinction. Yes, because thank you. They're all, it's all interconnected and you can't parse out which of the two it is. And I don't think it makes a difference. Um, I will, but, but I, I wanna make another comment. And Gabby, I really appreciate you bringing up the, the the challenge you went not, not the challenge but the, the as your life course changed and the way you thought about things changed because of your child i think that's important for people to be aware of and when our group got together part of the message we had to everyone was don't assume you're right don't assume whatever you think don't assume you have it right you need to listen carefully to what somebody else is saying and that was our main message to each other we asked everyone to stop defending themselves Stop being sure they're right, and actually acknowledge the other person may be right too. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of uh, Stephen Sondheim's Into the Woods. So there's a lyric there, witches can be right, giants can be good. You know that we have to remember that everybody has a perspective, that everyone's perspective is uh, involved. I ultimately think at the end of the day, when we do that, we end up coming out supporting families to do this thing. But it's really important to not think of those who have concerns as being bad or evil or misinformed. They're coming from a good place, but they haven't thought about it yet. Can I bring up something? Mm, sure. yeah, yeah. So, so based on what you were saying as well, you know, the bottom line is follow the money. And if, if you wanna take it to that extreme, I need help. If I can't get help, if I can't keep Ethan here, where is he going? And who's paying for where he's going? Mm -hmm. And how much is where he's going going to cost? 24-7 mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. It's beneficial to everyone that they stay in the home. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's a great point. Very good point, Sam. I think I think Ben is 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 correct that that's a false dichotomy, right? I mean, there's no reason why benefit to the family means negative benefit to the child. Uh, if they they are often aligned, um, and there's it's not a zero sum game, um, and I think um, that it's it's really important many times what helps the family also helps the child if staying in the home helps the child yeah yeah definitely any thoughts on that dustin and grace i saw yeah, you yeah, that's what i was going to say is you know and that that was a struggle for us when we made this decision to start this was was it helping us or was it helping Paxton? Um, and and it, it helped us both. You know, we couldn't give him the experiences we do today if, you know, he was still growing. Um, you know, and you know, Dr. Zeitler was talking about in his talk, you know, being able to transfer them in the Hoyer lift, you know, 
he has no muscle tone. So a Hoyer lift for us is not beneficial. It just folds him up. So therefore we can't use a lift. So we have to be able to pick him up and transfer him. Um, and you know, he's 60 pounds and that's a load right now, but if he was 150, there's no way we would be able to get him in and out and do things with him. Um, so it, it's very beneficial for everybody and keeping him in the home and keeping him with us and happy, um, well, outweighed all other 50 pounds like pressure sores and those kinds of things too mm -hmm. yeah great point point. and i think you know there was a question that came up about this and i don't think we'll be able to fully answer it dr zeitler but is about um you know if growth attenuation therapy impacts you know um motor or mobility um achievements you know and we don't know because we don't really have a control group necessarily but do you have any insights from your findings of, of the cases so far about whether um, those children who had growth attenuation maybe achieved, you know, greater development in some skill? Yeah, so we don't really know. I mean, there's no reason. I, 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 again, I think this is some misunderstanding. Um, we're not really affecting anything except the stature. Um, anecdotally, I've had some patients whose neurologists felt that they remained ambulatory longer because they were smaller um, and, you know, speculated that if they had gotten taller, they wouldn't have been able to have the muscle strength to, to remain at least partially ambulatory, but it's purely anecdotal. Yeah, and, and I think the more we do this, the more we'll learn. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Cindy. Well, just uh, with Ethan having uh, the the movement disorder and the hypermobility and the the jerkiness of his muscles and his bones, and the bigger he gets, the harder he's going to hit. And he's gonna he's gonna hit hard, but it's not in any way that he can control. So one of the things we did is taking all of that into consideration we did estrogen for Ethan so that, um, or estro, I don't know, is it progesterone or estrogen or the estradiol or whatever it is, it's not the testosterone because that estrogen. could have just led to even more mayhem. And it's just those little things that um, Dr. Canner at the University of Iowa was so incredible in, in discussing with me and, and, and talking about um, the best thing to do for us. Yeah, and there's a question about whether someone with something like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, whether this could keep a child walking longer, possibly. And I think I'll let you answer that, Dr. Slayer. I think you kind of did with me say, we don't really know, but. Yeah, that's even more complicated, though, because we also don't know the effect of estrogen on the dystrophinopathy itself. Um, that's different than a kid with uh, an abnormality that's unrelated to the muscles. Um, I think that would take some real thought. Right. But I would say, to be honest, for Duchesne's, the kids, you know, steroids are so common, uh, they're not growing. Most kids with Duchesne's yeah. are quite small already. Interesting. Yeah. And I think um, one of the things that I'm just looking back at my notes because I wrote down a bunch of stuff that I wanted to talk about too. Um, But yeah, and I think that um, it's going to be really interesting to see how things continue to progress around this um, and what we learn. But the more um, people that do it and document and, and we get to see what happens, the more we'll continue to learn about this. But, you know, and I'll encourage people if they have any final questions, we're going to be wrapping up in a couple minutes. Um, feel free to drop those in the chat. But um, you know, I'm just really grateful for this panel coming together to share. I think this has been a phenomenal discussion um, to help enlighten kind of what is the process? How does it work? Um, what does it look like? Um, there's a lot we're still learning. Um, and I think the, you know, interesting for us, you know, um, I mean, there has been a little bit of a growth spurt after we finished treatment too. So it's like, there's still a lot of things that we don't fully understand, right? There's a growth spurt when you start the treatment, there might be some after, 
there's nothing that's known for sure, for sure. Um, but you know, this is um, this is a work in progress, and I'm just so grateful that um, you know people like Dr. Wolfond um, were around, and all the people you worked with to kind of assess this, and Dr. Dekema. Um, and a number of other folks who initiated this process, understanding the real concerns of, of these families and these children and their needs. Um, and then, you know, Dr. Zeitler, I think you've probably touched most of the cases that this is um, who, of families who have been through this um, in the United States, at least that I know of. So um, thank you all for your leadership in this space um, and for Justin and Grace and Sandy Lee for sharing your stories. Um, really powerful testimonials. Um, and I'll say it here that um, Dustin and Grace are working on a really exciting project to share more about helping families who have wheelchair bound kids be able to do the kind of adventuring they do. So be on the lookout because we are going to be eager to share that when they, they launch that. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys want to say anything, but I think that's a really exciting adventure you guys are about to go on with that. Dustin, I'll let Dustin. <laughs> you know, um, we realize we we have a we're part of a uh, camp in Indiana. Our children get to go to a camp, um, and we realize we're lucky enough to have two wheelchair for trach and ventilator kids. Yeah, we sorry for trach, 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 Yeah, it's called Champ Camp. It's for trach and ventilator children, um, and uh, we're lucky enough to have two wheelchair vans um, through donations um, and support we have with family. And we realize that so many families don't have those vans and are able to get out on adventures, just even to go to doctor's appointments and, and, and realizing how much they cost. Um, you know, we're trying to, to work um, to be able to provide wheelchair vans um, so that families can take vacations, go to doctor's appointments, um, really help them access everyday life. Um, that is so huge. So it, it, I had it, to come up with money to just get a, rusty wheelchair van that but the ramp works and i'm very thankful yep. for that so, so dustin is is the idea that people would be able to like lease these or like access them for periods of time or well i mean you know we would like to we would like to donate them to the families yes. we would like to be able to ah, donate them to the families wow. we have a lot of work we have to do with that um you know but that yeah the goal is to donate them um and figure out a way that to help families with that. So we think that's the best route to impact as many people as we can, so. Yeah, you know, a, a one way station on the way might be, you know, timeshare vans. Yeah, that's um, good. You know, it's like, we want, we really want to do a two week trip to Utah. Yeah, Gabby? Yeah. I, I, so first of all, I really appreciate both, both all, both all the parents' comments here. The, because I think this is from that lack of better word, the elephant in the room. This is not a growth attenuation is a minor detail. The bigger issue is number one, the, as Sandy Lee described, the lack of access to services that families face. And I think what's really most tragic to me, and I'm first, I'm, I'm so glad that Dustin and Grace are here and sharing their pictures because if I were to say one of the biggest ethical issues facing families with disabilities, it's a combination of the lack of services and the related attitudes of clinicians who frankly think that because of the lack of services, we shouldn't be putting kids on trachs and vents because that's a bad thing for them and their families. And so if there's a single underlying ethical issue, it's getting out not only the need for the services, but the work that you guys are doing is so important because, it, and your pictures are so important, not just for parents, but for clinicians they need to see pictures of people in vents at a, at a football game. I think it was a football game you guys were at. Yeah. You know, that is what, the, doctors don't think of that. They don't appreciate that. They don't understand if a child with a trach in a vent, they're gonna be at a football game. And that is the most important message, I think, that will have a better impact on our attitude about disability. So I wanna thank both the parents on the, on the call, you know, all three of you, as well as in the audience, because we have to get this message out to other people that, all the parents are trying to do is to help themselves and their kids lead a meaningful life and they can do it with our support. And so I, would I just add want to put that out to all of you. Yeah, and I would add the access to services that that, that is also not just medical and healthcare services, but to the world, 
access Absolutely. to experiences, access to yes. new yes. sensations and feels and, and ways to engage with the world. And I think that's why, football yeah, exactly, Very football games. Serious. And Dustin and Grace are doing it and I love it. And you are role models for me to try to do more of it. So Sandy Lee. Uh, on this on this topic, the, the, I'm so thankful for all the help that I've received and the programs that I've been made aware of. Um, there again, back to the money. That's what I dealt with for 25 years in business. But my grandson's waiver allows eight thousand dollars in his lifetime for a vehicle or home modification. And because we couldn't get our Hoyer lift out of his bedroom, um, I decided to use it to cut a wall, cut my living room wall, and expand that area of my house. So I'm, that's done. He's six. And I, I really don't think a lot of people out there realize that the fact I got a let, you know, rusty wheelchair van 2006, it, it, it's huge because they're 20 to $60,000. I don't think I'll ever see that. Right. Yeah. And those- well, unless you guys were, <laughs> You're, right. you're working on it, Grace and Dustin. So say, we have been very lucky. Like we have had right people in the right places that just happen to be like, hey, we're trying to sell one. And we're like, oh, well, but okay. Yeah. So yep. we have been yep. in the right place in the right time, but that Wonderful. has happened for everyone. But you're exactly right. The cost of things for families with disabilities is um tremendous the it's kind of they know you need it and you have to have it and so unfortunately the price tags go up and up on on certain things and so that is definitely one of the uh, misfortunes with those things and when you were talking about luxury and things like that it doesn't just go to like the quality of life like yes the quality of life but then you also have insurance coming back at you and saying well, that's a luxury for the family. The kid doesn't really need that. And well, don't you like to walk in smoothly to your house? You don't want to have to up a stair and kind of flop in your chair. That's not a luxury. That's that that's just decent um, living. But those things are unfortunately deemed luxuries for families. And and so- or if the caregiver, like if I needed a, a Hoyer lift with uh, an electric Right. Right. You saw my well, spine. And it depends they don't care the- about my spine. They don't care <laughs> well, that and I those can't things do depend stuff. on the state too. So it depends right, on the right, state right. you live in and every right. state is different, which is crazy and unfortunate too. What's but again, I'm so thankful. Just like you guys have come across so many wonderful people. But when you're ready to sell a van, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's how it all happens right is it worth <laughs> yeah. out you got what yeah. like black market yeah. for you know it helps having a big mouth sometimes yeah well and i always joke that like you add the word wedding or adaptive to anything and it like 10 times the price for it right so it's like yeah. it's the world that we live in but well we are at time and thank you again everyone this has been a brilliant conversation that i think is going to be a really wonderful resource for the community for many years to come um I, the web the webinar will be uploaded online i will send out uh, and be posting on social media when this is up so everybody can access and send it along to all the people you talk to about growth attenuation therapy and when they need to learn more so a huge thank you to our experts dr zeitler and dr wilfon yes. Thank you, and you guys. Incredible advocates, parents, warrior, you know, warriors out there doing the job, Dustin, Grace, and Sandy Lee. Um, really grateful to have you with us. I'm going to share quickly that um, we are still working on our fall lineup, but for the, in the coming month, we have two more webinars coming up. Um, one about what we're learning about COVID-19 vaccines and infections um, and the rare epilepsies. Um, This is going to be accompanied by a survey that we are doing, um, some research that we're doing with a number of um, clinicians and researchers about COVID-19 and the rare epilepsies because there is not a lot of research, so we decided to do it. Uh, And then also um, a webinar about brain tissue donation and how important that is to learning more about these rare disorders that our families um, have challenges with. 
So I'll leave it there and um, we will see you all soon. I look forward to working with all of you on, on other fronts. We'll stay in touch. And thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you at the next one. Bye everyone. <laughs>